Boom. We are live. You are looking live. A live edition. Another one. Maybe we'll get 50,000 people watching like we did after the debate. I'm not so sure, Eric Messersmith, but we can always hope. I'm Charlie Marlowe. That is the great Eric Messersmith. We thought we would do the show live here. Even though it's it's 2 o'clock Central Time where I live, it is noon in the L.A. area where Eric lives. And then, look, some people, they have different work schedules, so people can jump on. They can jump in the chat and ask us questions. And we're just going to talk a little bit about the election and what's going on, Eric. How you doing, man? Doing well, man. I'm excited for our first daytime live show. Yes, we'll have a different audience. It'll be like the daytime soap operas, like all the moms yeah. that watch oh, um, Days of Our Lives and all that. We're very big with the stay-at-home moms and also the unemployed. So they sure. should be this that's kind of our target demo. Yes, and I'm sure I'm sure what I said about Days of Our Lives was somehow sexist also. So I'll just <laughs> I'll just apologize in advance. <laughs> Let's start here. So yesterday, the Quinnipiac poll came out, which was super interesting. I did a video on it. I did a live stream on it. So I'll throw it to you. For people that don't know, give them a rundown, a quick synopsis of the Quinnipiac poll and what you think it means. Oh, well, that one specifically was good for Harris. Or, I mean, that, yes. That, and in particular, it was the three blue wall states. I mean, we talked about this before. Big picture, Harris' easiest straightforward path to winning the election is to win the second congressional district of Nebraska, which she probably will, which is one electoral vote. She Biden won it. She's been ahead in the polling. And then win the blue wall states, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin. That would give her 270 electoral votes, assuming she wins everything else she's heavily favored to win, like Virginia, New Mexico, New Hampshire. That, then she would win 270 to 268. She'd be the president. So this poll pulled those three Midwestern states, and it was close to Wisconsin, plus one for Harris. Big, pretty big lead of Michigan, plus five. But the story of the poll was Pennsylvania, plus six, which was by far the best result she has had, maybe ever, but certainly recently. In fact, the reason Trump mainly has been holding so, has been doing so well, particularly before the debate in, in the betting odds and in some of the modeling even though he's been losing the popular vote in polling since Harris got in the race, is because of Pennsylvania. The swing states in general are so close, and Pennsylvania in particular has been basically 50-50. It still pretty much is, but Trump had been polling there really well, and there hadn't been a major or very few major national polls that showed Harris with a lead in Pennsylvania recently. There were some that were tied. There were some like Trump plus one. So to have a definitive lead for her was big. Now, I will say that was one poll. And, and what's happened here for, for the first week after the debate, from the day after up through, say, two days ago, we had some national polling that looked good. And it generally looked good for Harris. It increased her national lead. She was up in, in by four, five, six points in most of the national polls post-debate. But we had very little state polling. And what's happened in the last 24, 48 hours is now we're getting a ton of state polling. Emerson came out with its swing state poll today of likely voters. They pulled all seven swing states. Here are the margins. In Wisconsin, Trump plus one. Pennsylvania, Trump plus one. Arizona, Trump plus one. Michigan, Harris plus two. Georgia, Trump plus three, North Carolina, Harris plus one, Nevada tie. And I think the the general kind of big picture now, what are we, a week post-debate, is A, Harris got a bump from the debate. We don't know exactly how much because polling still coming in, but she definitely improved her position. B, she has solidified what I think is very clear, which is she is a strong favorite to win the popular vote. In fact, I would be really surprised if, if she loses the popular vote. But, and this is the big but, the Electoral College, it looks like, unless something dramatic changes in the next month and a half, is going to be a dogfight. It's going to be just like 2016 and just like 2020. Tens of thousands of votes, maybe low hundreds of thousands in two, three, four states is probably going to decide this election. But what's happened since Harris has gotten in the race, it's kind of all seven of those states have now converged to the point where they all are essentially close to 50-50, which is kind of crazy because North Carolina wasn't even really in the swing state conversation anymore when Biden was in the race. That was 
That was like basically Trump. Now you can make an argument North Carolina is more likely to vote Harris than Georgia or maybe even than Pennsylvania. Right. They're they're all just right there. And they're all so close. It's no longer just Pennsylvania, although I think my gut still tells me Pennsylvania is most likely to be the decisive state. But now all of these other states, all seven of them, are basically close to 50-50. Okay, so even though you now live in the L.A. area, you coastal elitist, you are a good old farm boy from Pennsylvania. So I got to ask you, do you really believe, and I asked you about the Quinnipiac poll, but do you really believe that Kamala Harris has a six-point lead? So I'm just looking at this political polls Twitter account that I follow, and basically general election poll in Pennsylvania has them tied 49-49. That was Washington Post, right? Here's another one. Here is Siena. They have Harris plus four, Trump 46, Harris 50. So, you know, you got you got one that's plus six Harris. You got one that's plus four for Harris. You have one that's essentially tied. Here's another one. FNM has Harris plus three, 49, 46 over Trump. And because I was kind of curious, I did actually do some, I did some homework. And I was thinking really? of Pennsylvania. Yeah, for once. I was thinking of Pennsylvania. So if you go back to 2016, when... Trump beat Hillary. So Trump won by like 44,000 votes in Pennsylvania. He won by 0.72%. Okay, go to 2020. Biden beats Trump by 80,000 votes, essentially about 1%. But then if you go to the midterms, 2022, so Fetterman, after a stroke, beats Dr. Oz by about five points, and your boy Shapiro just absolutely boat races Mastriano, Doug Mastriano, fifty-seven yeah. to forty-two, essentially plus. 15. Although, as much look as much as I love Shapiro, there should be an asterisk in that race because Mastriano was about the worst possible yes. candidate you could have. I mean, all out, like full-on election denier, conspiracy sure. guy. <clears throat> so I just throw that out there for some uh, for some some backdrop data for everybody. To basically say, I mean, let's just say, let's just say Harris is up three or four points if we don't believe the six. I mean, do you do you believe that is what I'm asking? No, no, I don't. I mean, I think it's going. I think right now it's probably a point or two either way, and I think on election day it will be a point or two either way, and maybe less, maybe maybe less than a point, like it has been the last two races. Look, I think one of the things about polling that I don't know if confuse is the, is the right word, but one of the things that people who don't like polling point to, and one of the things who the people don't know much about polling sometimes get confused by is they look at one poll and they're like, Oh, this is wrong. And, and if, if you look at one poll, it's very likely it will be wrong because polling is hard. It's a science. It's not exact. It's a, you know, it, it, they have a margin of error for a reason. It's hard to get a hold of people on the phone and vice versa. It's hard to get the right demographic breakdown. But if you, but that's why it's so important. If you're really going to look at polling, and the reason that polling's pretty damn good overall is if you aggregate it, right? If you put it all together. And that's why I said earlier, if you put it all together in the mix, Right now, Nate Silver has Harris up by about, about a point and a half in Pennsylvania. I'd buy that. I think that's that is more likely to me than six. That sounds fair. And look, outlier polls should not be discarded. What you should do with them is put them into the average. Like if you look at the national polling post debate, Harris is ahead in basically all of them. But New York Times Siena today, which is one of the best pollsters with the best track record, has it tied. There was another poll called Atlas that came out last week that had Trump by three. Again, a pretty highly rated pollster. You don't throw those out, but you put them in the mix with everything else and you average it together. And again, I just go back to real clear politics, which does the aggregation. But I but if you're nerd into the stuff, they do it just by like putting it all together and averaging it out right without any kind of factoring for which polls might be better. Yeah, there you go. There's the average. That is the average of all the l recent polls in real clear politics. It's Harris by what is it? 1.9. Yeah. Okay. 
So the difference between that, that's, oh, that's better than looking at, at one poll. But what's even better is what Nate Silver and other polling um, forecasters do sometimes is they take them and they weigh them based on how good they are, their track record of the pollster, and also what their house effect is, which house effect is like if every poll Trump is you have all year, Trump is ahead by like three points more than everybody else. And then that turns out you're wrong. Then they're going to weigh that a little bit differently, right? For Rasmussen is a great example. Rasmussen always has great results for Trump. It's always an outlier for Trump. But the reason Rasmussen still matters, even though it's not a great poll, is because if it has Trump by 10, you're like, well, that's pretty good for Trump, even in Rasmussen. But if it has Trump by one, you're like, oh, this is Trump's in trouble, right? So that's why you still throw even those outlier polls into the mix. You just, but you can't weigh them the same as you would, say, the New York Times Siena poll, which has a unbiased track record for the most part. And that's why the polling averages, for instance, that Nate Silver does are important is because they factor in what the what the lean of the poll is. I won't say the word bias, the lean of the poll is, and also how good its track record is. But the reason I say that is real, even a simple, um, real clear politics, just throw them all together and average them out without weighing them at all, right? The thing I love about real clear politics is they have this same date in 16 and 20 which is so important because Trump has been a candidate now in all three of these elections, right? So September 19th of 2016, this exact same point, Hillary Clinton led Trump by 0.9. She won by 2.1. So that means that the final margin, okay, was, was one point different than what the polling average had on September 19th. I mean, that's pretty damn good, wouldn't you say? Even in 2020, yes. which you get, remember 2020, crazy times, COVID, people are dying or schools hospital, or closed down businesses. Not a great time to try to pull people when the world's upside down. The spread that day, September 19, 2020, was Biden by six and a half. He won by four and a half. So even that year, the polling was only off two from the final margin on September 19, 2020, roughly six weeks out where we are now, six, seven weeks out. So. For people who don't like polling, I I don't know what to tell you. I mean, it's not perfect. Some years it's <laughs> it's been more off than others, but it's pretty good, particularly if you weigh the polls. Like another kind of tangent thing. One one thing people point to is they'll be like, well, 2022 polling said there would be a red wave. Everyone mm-hmm. talked about the red wave, right? Traditionally, party in the White House gets crushed in their first midterm. Biden was not popular at that point, even. People are like, well, Republicans are in good shape here. And they did win the Senate. Uh, or sorry, they did win the House, but barely. And they didn't win the Senate. They had they underperformed dramatically. But if you look at the actual polling and you look at the best, better pollsters, not the kind of Republican, Republican-leaning pollsters came out with these polls that had Republicans doing great. But if you look at just kind of the neutral pollsters, they had it about you know, Republicans with maybe a slight edge, but pretty close. And that's basically what happened in 2022. So I say all that to say the polling, not perfect, but it gives you a pretty good snapshot of where you are and where the race is headed. Okay. Let's get to a question here. Get your questions in folks who are watching live. Our guy or gal stories says, what is your opinion of the Atlas Intel poll that has Trump leading the popular vote? by 3.6%. I'll just say this. I just think, I I don't ever want to say zero chance. Like before I said there was zero chance that Joe Biden would win the election. When I say zero, I mean very, very little chance. I just, I don't see Donald Trump winning the popular vote. And it's funny because you brought up 2022. And I'm starting to wonder if this race in 2024 is actually not going to be that close. I'm not, I'm not going out on a limb and saying that, but the more, the more I think, and I watch, I do think there's something to our guy, Alan Lichtman, who likes to talk about polling as sports talk radio. And let's be honest, pollsters, some are better than others, but also the media in general need this election to be close so that we can talk about it every day. And this is not just me being conspiracy theorist. 
I'll go right to what you said about 2022, which I which I agree with. First of all, I think the reason there was no red wave, two massive reasons. One was Roe v. Wade, in whatever order you want to put it in. But I think I think this was the first time you could kind of vote after January 6th and the overturning of the election attempt by Donald Trump. I, I really believe an exit polling also spoke to this. That was a huge reason there wasn't a red wave. And also, go back to 2022, two years ago, the economy was in much worse shape. Now, you can, you can say, look, inflation has, has lingered much longer. That's 100% true. But let's just, let's just throw it like this. So of the things I said, okay, um, January 6th, still, still in people's minds, something that Donald Trump can't change. Roe v. Wade, still a huge issue favoring Democrats, right? The economy, not great, but better, clearly, in 2024 than in 2022. And then maybe the, the biggest part, at that time, even though it's a midterm, Joe Biden is essentially on the ballot as the figurehead for Democrats as a, a doddering 80-year-old. And now, even if you don't love Kamala Harris, you have pretty much a normal 60-something Democrat. When I look at how the the Democrats overperformed in 2022, I mean, you tell me, Eric, what has changed to benefit Republicans in terms of elections in the last couple of years, do you think? Well, uh, from 2022 to now? Yeah. I think several things have changed. First of all, I think January 6th is further in the rearview mirror. Okay. I think there's been a whitewashing of it by conservative media that's been pretty effective. I think Donald Trump, despite his many, many flaws, has a lingering appeal to rural, mainly white, working class people that is really, really hard to shake. In a general I, election, though? Even in a general election to those people, and those people will come out big for him. I think there's an anti-incumbency mood in the world. I mean, look at elections in every democracy around the world recently. The, for the most part, the incumbent party has gotten their ass kicked. That is not an American phenomenon. Justin Trudeau is in a ton of trouble right now in Canada. The Tories, who had been in charge in, in Britain forever, just got crushed in an election this year. Um, in, in India, the biggest democracy in the world, Moody, who's been there forever, his party got killed in the recent elections. There is an anti-incumbency mood around the world. There's probably a lot of reasons to play into that. COVID, inflation, social media, whatever. But that's real. Number two, the economy. The economy overall, and you and I have spent whole shows talking about this. There is a lot to like in the economy. I think the economic picture, considering where we were and where we are now, is pretty remarkable. And, and I think it's been overall, considering where we were, and you saw what the Fed did the other day, cutting interest rates, basically showing you we've essentially defeated inflation without a recession which is a major accomplishment. That said, prices were up 20% higher than they were three years ago. I don't care who, if you told me nothing else and you just told me the party in the White House is presiding over a term where prices went up 20%, do you think their candidate will win the next election? I would say probably not, right? If you just didn't give me any names, no parties, you just told me that one fact, I would say they're going to have a tough time. And then the other thing is, and this gets back to your earlier point and your blowout point, the 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 electoral college, right? I didn't say blowout. Did I say no, blowout? You said, you said it could be a blowout. I and said, I, I said, I think it could be too. And the popular vote. Okay. But we don't determine our elections by the popular vote. And that is the probably the biggest thing Trump has going for him. He has a big and potentially very big advantage in the electoral college. Okay. Um, I'm Mr. Semantics oh, can I now. Can I well, let me just say real quick. Yeah, go, go ahead. On. Yeah, go. Go. I was just saying, I no, wanted you to go. answer the, the Atlas question because I, I the 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 question about at, the Atlas poll. Yeah. Trump 3.6, which is the only poll in the Real Clear Politics database since the debate that has Trump ahead. New York Times, CNN has them tied. So I don't know anything about that pollster. Um, again, I trust Nate Silver. He has them rated highly. That poll then rates highly in his forecast. I'll take his word for it. He's looked at past results. I've not, you know, obviously done that. But here's what I would say. So, so put it in. But again, 
this is why averages are so important. Like, imagine this. Let's say that we knew for a fact that Kamala Harris today was ahead by two points. Let's just say we could sample every American who will vote, and we could say with 100% certainty that Kamala Harris was ahead by two points. That was the true measure. And then you ha- let's say you had 10 polls, which have margins of error. They sample people. What would you expect those 10 polls to say if the true result was Harris plus two? Well, all 10 of them aren't going to say Harris plus two, right? Because they're sampling small groups of people. You would expect some would have Harris plus two. Some would have Harris plus one. Some would have Harris plus six. A few would have it tied. And there would be one or two that would have Trump ahead by two or three points. That's what you would expect to happen if Harris is ahead by two. So what I'm trying to say is Atlas's poll could be totally fine at Trump plus three. And Harris could still be ahead by two. In fact, I think that's what's true. I think what is true is Harris right now is ahead by about three points. And if you had a group of 10 or 15 polls with Harris really up three, you would expect a few of them would show a tie or Trump ahead. So that answers kind of the the Atlas specific question. Okay, and let me just clarify. When I say I don't think this election is going to be close, I guess what I mean is there's this thought that. Democrats or Kamala Harris, they're going to win this by just holding the blue wall and winning 270 to 268. Now, when I say close election, I guess that also means, you know, do you think 2020 was a close election? Because Electoral College, Joe Biden got 306 Electoral College votes. But we know if just tens of thousands in three states switch over then all of a sudden Donald Trump wins despite losing the popular vote by 4.5 points, whatever it is. I guess what I'm saying is if you look at the Electoral College map from 2020, I think I think there's a very good chance that this election ends up like that, meaning that Kamala Harris maybe again give her Nevada, maybe not Arizona, but maybe Arizona, maybe North Carolina, not Georgia. Remember, Joe Biden won Georgia, Nevada, Arizona. He did not win North Carolina in 2020. But I think there's a very good chance Kamala Harris holds the blue wall, wins Nevada, wins, let's say, North Carolina. And all of a sudden, it just doesn't feel that close, I guess is what I'm saying. Oh, and I think that's a totally possible scenario. I think another... One other th- point you said, why do I think this election will just probably be closer than twenty than it should be based on 2022? And I, I gave you several. The other one is we are in a period of American history of very close elections. We have very high polarization right now. And, and throughout American history, we've gone through periods like this where we have been essentially a 50-50 country. Go back to tw- 2000. Every election since 2000 has been historically close with the exception of of 2008. That was the one blowout election in this whole cycle. And even that, I think Obama won by six points, six or seven points, when you had an economy that was literally on the verge of collapse. Like we were, we were, you know, close to like a second depression, basically. We had to bail out banks and stop the economy from crashing. And even then, it wasn't a a historic blowout, right? It wasn't like a Reagan 84 type win, right? So my point is we are in a high polarization environment where the the floor and the ceiling for both parties is pretty close. No matter who the candidates are, no matter what the circumstances are, the election is going to be fairly close. Then you add in the Republicans advantage in the Electoral College. I think these states that are very close often break together, to your point. Remember in 2000, all of the states that were close for the most part broke Biden with the exception of North Carolina. It's 2016, almost all the very close states broke Trump. That's usually what happens. And it kind of makes sense with the popular vote I talked about earlier. Hillary only won by two. And in a right now, in a Democrat plus two environment, the Republicans are probably going to win most of the close states and win the Electoral College. That's just kind of the way the Electoral College bias is right now. On the other hand, look at Biden in 2020. He won by four and a half. At Democrat plus four and a half, most of the close states are probably going to break for the Democrats. So the question, of course, is what happens if you're in between? And I th- and that's kind of, if you believe the polling, and I do, that's where we are now. 
Harris's lead right now is in between Hillary Clinton's lead, which was a Trump win, and Joe Biden's lead, which was a Trump loss. Kamala's lead, Kamala Harris's lead is in between that. And so that leads you to believe if you're in between that, it's going to be in most likely incredibly close. And we're probably in for weeks of recounts and court challenges and God only knows what. Okay. I'm curious what you think about this. We did, we did a whole show hour and 45 minutes after the debate, but then also you can kind of uh, let the dust settle. You can, you can uh, look at some new polls. You can hear from some different pundits and I'll bring up two that I saw. One was Bill Maher on real time. The other is Frank Luntz which I saw, it might have been Chris Cuomo's show. I can't remember exactly, but I saw this clip. Bill Maher basically said he thinks that Trump lost the election after the debate. And Frank Luntz, who is a famous, well-known Republican pollster, used to be, who now I believe he teaches at West Point, but he essentially said the same exact thing. And uh, I, I don't know. I just I do think that that debate was a seismic shift because... Kamala looked presidential, sounded presidential. She wasn't perfect, but also Trump came across unhinged about the crowd sizes. And we can get into the dogs and cats and what is what is exactly being eaten where in Ohio. But he he came across to most reasonable people as as kind of a looney tune. And yeah. when Bill Maher, who, by the way, it's funny to say this, but he's about as down the middle as you can get these days. Honestly, I know, I know he leans left typically, but he's, he's pretty common sensible. He's, he's become a moderate almost in these, uh, in these times we're in. Isn't it crazy? Well, I think he's become a moderate. I always say this about myself. Like, I don't think I've changed. I don't think Bill Maher's changed. I think everybody else is going crazy. And again, Frank Luntz, who's a, a, a well-known Republican pollster, he essentially said the same thing. And I also I just get this sentiment that people are tired of Trump. And I think Trump would have beaten Biden. I I 100% do. But I think Kamala Harris is just enough newness, just enough change cuz you said incumbency, right? Is bad all around the world in election. It, it used to be a big advantage. Incumbency used Correct. to be a huge advantage. Not so much now. Now it's almost a right. disadvantage. But but I think there's just something to Kamala Harris saying, "Yeah, I'm attached to Joe Biden." but I'm not Joe Biden. And she said that two or three times at the debate when Trump kept bringing up Biden. She goes, look, you're not running against Joe Biden. And I, I think in a way, the Trump campaign has never been able to pick their momentum back up since the old switcheroo. Yeah, let me give you my thoughts on that. A combination of kind of analysis and then my opinion, uh, but I think it's right. And I, I think it's true. Whenever the candidates are compared, Kamala dominates him. Mm -hmm. And I think the reason for that is, is Trump is a little nutty and extreme. And he tried to overturn an election, and Kamala seems, by contrast, much more reasonable and presidential. And that is why I think she dominated him in the debate. Even the convention speeches, hers was much better. So when the race becomes, you look at these two, and I think this is what Bill Maher and Frank Luntz and others got caught up in. They saw them on stage together and said, come on. Like, how could anyone look at these two people and not see that Kamala Harris is clearly the better candidate and the person better equipped to be the president. I happen to agree with that. I think that's true. But here's what I think Luntz and Maher are missing is that if you take Harris and Trump back a little bit and you just go with the generic Republican and generic Democrats, yeah. Republicans have the advantage. And the reason they have the advantage, again, anti-incumbency mood, Inflation that was 20% over the last three years, a sense the border was chaotic. Joe Biden being, you know, almost wanting to run for president until he was 86 and having his senior moments. And again, the biggest thing, the electoral college advantage they have. So I think you have this fight on the one hand to people who maybe aren't super partisan or MAGA. Kamala Harris, I think, in terms of just presidential demeanor, discipline, knowledge. She is a superior candidate. But Paul, if you look at policy, again, I pointed out Goldman Sachs, they analyze both candidates' economic plans. 
They said Trump's would make the deficit worse. It would raise inflation. Like if you look at a lot of policy, I think Harris is, is probably better. But the Republicans have natural advantages. And that gets back to what we talked about before. If you sub out Trump and you put in maybe Nikki Haley, would it be different? I think it probably would be. I think Haley would have a much better chance to win. But I think those two, those are the two forces fighting against each other. And that's why I say, as much as I agree with Mara and Luntz, that the debate performance by Trump was borderline disqualifying. I mean, it was really, a, it, it was, Harris was good. I want to be clear. She did a good job, particularly in executing her strategy of goading him. But the biggest thing about that debate was Trump was borderline disqualifying. Like he rambled on incessantly, eating the cats and dogs, defending overturning the election, defending January, trying to overturn the election, defending January 6th, talking about concepts of a plan for healthcare. I mean, this is a guy who's been running for president or been the president for nine years. He was exposed on that stage as borderline unfit to be president. But when you that's not going to happen every day, right? That was a one-time event. And now we're back to the mundane campaign and people are like, oh yeah, I went to the grocery store and it's expensive. You know what I'm saying? So I think when you fall back into the kind of neutral environment, that favors Trump. When you have the direct comparisons of the candidate, it favors Harris, but that's not going to happen again. There's probably not going to be another debate. So that's why I think the race is going to go back to its natural state, which is a dog fight tens of not to, to pardon the pun there uh not the dogs that, that are allegedly being eaten by the haitians that's why i think the race is going to go back to its natural state which is tens of thousands of votes in six or seven states i'm not ready to make a definitive declaration but but i i'm, I'm kind of saying the same thing twice now i i think this election is going to come down to reasonable people reasonable people in the middle independents, liberal conservatives, conservative Democrats who are just kind of tired of Trump's act. And it starts to me, we may be able to go back and say the reason Trump lost in 2024 is trying to overturn the election in 2020. I think it might be that simple because that was a red line for most reasonable people, including myself. I don't care. I could... I really don't care if a Democrat or Republican, you, you, you vote for one way, but like I'm 42 years old. You've had Bushes, you've had, uh, you know, Trump. Most people realize it's going to go back and forth, but when somebody does something, you know, you mentioned disqualifying for the debate. I don't think Trump's performance in the debate was disqualifying. I mean, I think it was bad, but I think for a lot of reasonable Americans trying to overturn the election, watching what they saw on January 6th, America looking like a, a banana republic, third world country. I think that's a red line that some people, I think enough of a percentage of people cannot get past. And then when you just, I, I just think there's a fatigue with Trump. And by the way, I've never been this person about the tweets, like the mean tweets. I agree with Republicans when they go, oh, I sure could use some mean tweets right now and $2 gas. I agree with that. Trump's a little loony, but also this dude's almost 80 years old. He's running for president and he's whatever truth, social truth. He's truthing. I hate Taylor Swift. Again, right. it doesn't matter. I don't care. I'm not a Taylor Swift fan. I don't care. Imagine if, if Kamala Harris said that, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. There's also, yeah. there's two standards. Like there is if, if you, cause I'm not on truth social, but I follow the account that always posts Donald Trump's um, truth socials on Twitter. And yeah, he comes too. across all the time as a lunatic, honestly, yeah. all he's caps. Not. He's like your uncle who just on Facebook tweets the most ridiculous conspiracy theories. And Trump is essentially doing that on Truth Social and in the debate. Again, if you right. want to get into the dogs and cats thing, I think that's interesting. I'm more along the lines of Republicans than people would probably think on that. But just like throwing out the crazy conspiracy theories to millions of people on the debate. That's something my uncle does on Facebook. Yeah, right. Well, and it just it just showed everybody and reminded everybody that he's the kind of person who would do that, who hangs out with Laura Loomer and some of these yes. other crazy people. That's who he is. And so I agree with everything you said. I mean, to me and to millions of other people watching, the choice is obvious and clear who the superior candidate would be. I, it's not even close. But, 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 I think there is just an underestimation of 
pocketbook issue, yeah. particularly inflation, and mm-hmm. and how devastating that is for Democrats. For instance, if if you ran this exact same election with these exact same candidates and inflation over the last four years had only been the typical two or three percent a year um, versus the big numbers we saw, like, for instance, prices during the Trump four years went up eight percent from the time he became president, the time he left office, eight percent. Biden under Biden, it's about 20. If it had been the eight percent that we saw under Trump, and Republicans didn't have this structural advantage in the Electoral College, I think Harris would be, in the betting odds, 70% plus to win this election. I think she'd be cruising to a, a win. Or maybe even Biden, if he was you know, if he was still in the race. But, but those two things pull it back and make it close. And that is the thing you always have to remember whenever, and, and that's what I think Bill Maher and Frank Luntz and others are missing is those two facts don't change because of a debate. When people go to the grocery store and they're reminded, they may be like, well, Trump's a little crazy. And I'm sure you, I know people like this in my life. I'm sure you know it. They don't love Trump. They don't even agree with some of his policies, but they're like, you know, I just remember things were better under him in terms of things being cheaper. It didn't cost as much when I went to the grocery store. And, and then there, and then there's the other, the thing I keep going back to the electoral college bias that Trump has. It's a big deal, man. I mean, he's going to lose, think about that. He's going to lose the popular vote most likely for the third straight time. And yet he may win the presidency for the second straight time. That is crazy, but that is potentially what, you know, what we're looking at. Yeah. And by the way, I agree with you. I think if, if you went line by line on policy, I think Republicans have the advantage in, in a lot of them. That Quinnipiac poll, actually, I was surprised with some of the margins, how well, Harris has I, gotten closer. Go, but I like, just, I just, go ahead. No, yeah. I just want to say, I don't believe that. I, I think Repu- Democrats, in terms of what they're proposing right now, are better on policy, even though I don't agree with everything. But what I'm saying is the perception of inflation yes. is, is such a big advantage for Trump or for any Republican. Yeah, that's fair. I'm just kind of looking at, Here's and I laugh when I say this because like these proposals of plans, I kind of laugh because almost none of these things ever get passed. Right. Like when I'm when I'm watching these debates sometimes and I'm like, well, who has a plan? Like whose proposal is better? And I'm thinking nobody does any of these things. Right. Like I think you can look at what, you know, Biden passed a bunch of stuff. You know, Donald Trump was better on the border. The economy was really good under Trump. But then COVID hit. See, I also think like you bring up inflation and I know we've had this debate a thousand times. I do think there are a lot of reasonable people in the middle. Like they know why we have inflation. I understand it plays politically on the right to blame it all on, on, on Biden and Kamala now, but like, we know that we spent, we just printed trillions of dollars. The last year of Trump, the first year of Biden, we had two years of ridiculous spending. We had all the supply chain disruptions for COVID. Then we had two plus years now of inflation. I'm not saying Joe Biden is perfect. Kamala Harris isn't perfect. I think that's why I'm saying I I think this election really will come down to reasonable people in the middle that just want to see our country go in a different direction and go back to a little bit of what we had before. And, And I think some of that is boring. Like I understand Kamala Harris to me, she's not generational, you know, but like when I grew up, I feel like it was okay having boring candidates and I'm throwing like, you know, John Kerry and Mitt Romney and, and John McCain. I mean, Barack Obama was Bush, Biden, Biden. I think Kamala Harris is just a throwback and it's, it's not all good because you can say these are all these neocons back in the day. And some of the Republicans and Democrats almost seem the same, but I just feel a Trump fatigue. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong. I also, I think about this, Eric, as I'm driving through the greater St. Louis area, I see way fewer election signs overall. I see way fewer Trump signs. I don't live out in the country, but I don't know. I don't think, I don't think people are proud as proud to say I'm voting for Trump, but also I don't think people are as proud to say they're, they're voting for Kamala or they're a Democrat either. So Look, people are just really fatigued by the system. I, I don't know they who are. that benefits. I, I would say it probably benefits Kamala because she's just she's just enough of the newness, right? Yeah. 
She's just a little bit newer than Trump, who who people are sick of. It's just true. They're just sick of him. Yeah. And look, my as much as I've pushed back against, you know, what you're saying and what Bill Maher and Frank Luntz and others are saying, if I had to pick, like if you forced me to make a prediction right now, I think Harris will win. I think Harris will win the popular vote by about the same margin Biden did, 51-46 with a couple percent for third party candidates. And I think she'll squeak by on the Electoral College like Biden did, winning the the decisive states by, you know, tens or low hundreds of thousands of votes. I think that's probably where we're headed. But do I have a high degree of confidence in that? No, no, I don't. And the reason I don't is because I've seen this show before twice with Donald Trump. And I go back to the Electoral College bias and I go back to the inflation. And those things are just so hard to overcome, especially for people who don't pay super close attention to these things and, and will be the people that might decide this election. So I generally tend to agree with you. I also factor in my own bias. Like, I think Harris is a much better candidate. And I think Donald Trump, after, you know, as Dick Cheney said, I don't think he should ever be trusted with power again. So I have to recognize I have that bias, too, right, when I look at it. So that's why, again, I'm, I'm saying I just think Trump is going to hang in there despite all of his flaws to the end. And this is going to come down to a very, very small number of votes in, in the key states, even if Harris wins a fairly comfortable victory in the popular vote, which I think she probably, probably will. All right, let's talk about this this Haitian immigrant Springfield, Ohio story. The cats and the dogs. That's what's getting all the headlines. The more I I I read about this, I watch interviews about this. I've watched a bunch of people talk about this. The either the mayor or the city manager. I did watch a, a YouTube clip of him on with Chris Cuomo, and I'm not a big JD Vance fan, but I do think he speaks truthfully and correctly when he says like the dogs and the cats, which may not be true at all, or a small kernel of it might be true somewhere in Ohio. It's gotten people to pay attention to an issue and I'm all for immigration. I'm all for legal immigration and I'm all even for helping people. You know, these people in, in Haiti that are refugees or going through crisis down there in, in a country where it's really hard to succeed and survive. But also like, to me, there has to be a limit. You can't just dump, you know, that's a, a, a harsh term, but like, you can't just go ahead and, and add all these people to a community and act like it's going to happen seamlessly. That's not fair to the, the citizens that live there. It's not fair to the people coming in from Haiti. And the more I read about this, the fact that you have um, systems being basically uh, overwhelmed in terms of the hospital, there's all this disease because of low vaccine rates in Haiti. These folks obviously don't speak English. They don't know our driving laws. There's all kinds of issues with reckless driving. And again, as a person who I'm pro, I'm pro legal immigration, I'm pro helping people out. And I'm, I'm, by the way, this interview I watched is either the city manager or the mayor of Springfield, Ohio. I have no idea if he's a Democrat or Republican after this 10 minute interview. And that's the best compliment I can give this guy. I have no idea his, pol his politics, but he was like, he was trying to be nice about it. He's like, we, we got overwhelmed with people. We can't handle it. We need help. And so it took the, the, the cats and the dogs crazy comment for people to understand that. Like I'm more along, I'm more with Republicans on this one than I am Democrats, even though Trump said crazy stuff. But like these people in Springfield, it really does seem like this is overstressing everything in the in the in the area. Yeah, look, I think a lot of things can be true at the same time. And sometimes I think we struggle with that. Like it can be true that there are a lot of problems at which in Springfield, which you outline many of them very well, because you had a town of 60,000 people roughly that had roughly 15,000 Haitian immigrants come into that area in a fairly short period of time. It could also be true that the Trump Vance way of attacking it has gone like way over the top, bordering yeah. on like racism to bring in unfounded claims of eating cats and dogs. There, there's a couple of claims of some geese being swiped up at the park, right? That's that's the extent of what we have in terms of the animals. No, no, no dogs or cats being killed or eaten that we know of, right? I mean, you never know, right? It's crazy. 
one did maybe is there one person who may have done it somewhere that we haven't heard about yet but the point is it demonizes an entire group and here's one of my biggest problems with it these are people here legally these are not people who jumped the fence and are are broke the law they came here legally and, and, and i didn't know a lot about the springfield situation i'll be honest even when it first came up but since time has gone by there's been a lot more reporting on it so what happened was you had a town, and I grew up in a town like this, where you had a lot of people that left the town and a lot of industry that left the town, and the town was kind of struggling. But they did have land, and they did have factories. And so their economic development people, I think, smartly said, hey, let's try to turn this town around. Let's try to revitalize this area. We don't really have a lot of workers here. Let's bring in workers for these factories. And it worked. It worked too well. And what happened was the these Haitian immigrants came to the country. And the reason they can come here legally is because we have a long tradition in America, and I think a good one, of helping people who are in dire circumstances in countries that are collapsing. And Haiti is a great example of that. If you've been following the news, this country has essentially been taken over. This is not an exaggeration by armed gangs who run a large chunk of the country, if not most of it, and, and kill people and extort people and kidnap people. And so you have these desperate people who applied for this status through this program, came here legally, and are working. These are not people sitting here collecting welfare, draining resources. By and large, they are working, helping to revitalize that area. And, and the guy I, I, I love on this is Mike DeWine. You know, I'm not a Republican anymore. I'm an independent. But I, he's a Repo I would vote for him in a heartbeat. I, he's I great. love Mike DeWine. He's, he's awesome. great. And the way he talks about this, he ho he does the thing that Trump is incapable of doing, and Vance as well, too. Although Vance is capable, he just chooses not to. And that is holding two thoughts in your mind at the same time. On the one hand, these are people who are here legally working, and we shouldn't demonize them. On the other hand, to the point you made earlier, the, the Biden-Harris administration should have done a better job of providing resources to the local community when you had this program that was allowing these Haitians to come here legally to work. When you saw that a large number of them were migrating to Springfield, you should have surged resources into that town to deal with the kind of things you're talking about, to deal with the increased burden on, the med on medical care, on the school system, the driving problems you're having. That would have been, and, and DeWine has talked to the federal government and is asking, and the state and the feds are beginning to try to get more help in there. That's the way to deal with this. Demonizing immigrants, especially those that are here uh, legally. And, and look, there's a way to talk about this that points out the problems, but doesn't demonize the immigrants. That's the way DeWine talks about it. And other people have talked about it. That's not the way that Trump and Vance have talked about it. And that is my problem with Trump and Vance. If you want to say I'm against illegal immigration. We need to crack down on that. I'm with you 100%. The Biden administration has a terrible record up until the last few months on that issue. And that's totally fair to talk about. It's fair to talk about the problems of, of large migration and, and the issues that can cause. But there's a way to do it without demonizing the people, again, that are here legally and are working. And it gets back to why I can't get totally on board with the Republicans, even on immigration. Because I don't agree with chaos at the border. I don't agree with large-scale illegal immigration. But I also don't agree that we need to go after legal immigration. We need more legal immigration because we aren't having babies in this country. Our birth rate is falling. If we don't bring people in, we're going to have a economy that's going to get smaller and smaller and smaller over time because we have fewer and fewer people. Now, we need to do it orderly. We need to make sure we're bringing in people who we've checked out. We need to to crack down extensively on illegal immigration, fine. But you don't hear Trump, for the most part, he does every once in a while, you don't hear him really talk about that. What he talks about is mass deportations and they're eating the cats that are eating the dogs. I, I will say this, though, and this is more of a big picture point. I, I, I align more with Republicans just overall on immigration than I do Democrats, although I don't agree with everything and, and their rhetoric can be, can be pretty ugly sometimes but i think at the end of the day the reason that for lack of a better word we we allow as much immigration is i think 
look, this country is run by corporations and whether you're Democrat, Republican, and whether these folks are legal or illegal, corporations love cheap labor. And whether these people are coming over illegally or in this case, legally, the Haitian immigrants, let's be real about this. A lot of these people that are coming from countries where it's being run by cartels, they are so happy to just be in America and be somewhere safe. They literally will work for anything. You, you, can, you can pay these people way less. I do think that suppresses wages for workers overall. And that's a big part of this that I think if I'm a Republican, I would focus more on that. Right. And here's me. I'm 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 pro immigration, pro legal immigration, and I even think we should take in these refugees a, a certain amount of them if it makes sense. But let's be real. It is suppressing wages for working class citizens who are from the United States of America. And to me that's that's the reason this this happens. That's the reason it's really allowed is that the corporations that that run this country, they love cheap labor. I think that is a large part of it. I think that's totally true. But I think there's a there's a balance because it I think it, look, I think it is true that the competition for labor does drive down wages. But I think it's also true that there are some jobs and some industries that would be very very hard to fill with a native born population unless Agreed. you paid a wage that was so ludicrously high that a business yeah. could never function. And that's part of the issue. Like Springfield theoretically could have done this by attracting workers from Minnesota or North Dakota or California, but it didn't happen. It happened when, when you had, because why? Because if I'm in Minnesota, do I want to move to Springfield, Ohio to take a job making essentially probably what I could make in Minnesota? Probably not. If I have no ties to Springfield, Ohio, would I do that? Would I work in that factory? You see what I'm saying? But the Haitians, they, and that is the, his, by the way, that's not a unique thing of 2024. That's the history of America. That's where most of our grandparents and great grandparents came from and what they did. They fled into, they came to this country and they worked these jobs that other people maybe didn't want or they, and they helped revitalize and build these industries. Now, is there a point where it becomes too much? 100%. And over the last few years, it has been too much. We have had millions of people come across this border and stay in this country, even though they're not legally, technically allowed to be here. And that's a problem. That's a huge problem. But to me, that's different than a limited legal program to help people in different countries. And I think we need a balance. And again, I just point to the long-term demographics. The birth rate is probably not changing. If you look at developed countries all over the world, birth rates are falling. It's not an America thing. It's happening in Asia. It's happening in Europe. D different economies, different cultures, it's happening everywhere. And other countries like China, it's going to put them in a huge bind. Their, their population is going to shrink dramatically. But the, the advantage we have in America is we are a destination and we have a history of assimilating immigrants. And that gives us a huge advantage if, if we take advantage of it. We can still thrive and grow our economy despite a declining birth rate. Other countries don't, don't have the ability to do that. Now, as long as we manage it smartly, I think that is not only what we should do, it's a necessity because we will not have the workforce to support our aging population otherwise. We're just not making enough babies, Charlie. Well, let's get on it, man. Come on, let's do this. Okay, <laughs> just because you brought up DeWine, I am a uh, a native Ohioan, although I haven't lived in Ohio full time since 2000, and not even part time since 2004. But I bring this up because I think it's it's interesting. Tim Ryan, who I just absolutely love, and he lost the Senate seat to J.D. Vance. So basically, J.D. Vance won 53 to 47. Okay, so he he won by about six points in the Trump era. Ohio has become like an eight point, maybe 10. Don't quote me on about, about eight, 10 point red state. But this goes to show you how popular Mike DeWine is. So in 2018, Mike DeWine won his gubernatorial election by basically, let's just call it mm, three, four points, whatever it is, three and a half points. He won in 2022 by 25 points points. Partly 
a, a huge part of it is the way he handled COVID. He handled it in a very reasonable down the middle, like let's not go crazy either way. Let's not shut everything down, but let's also be safe about it. And he's right up there. He doesn't have the national profile of Ron DeSantis, but you could make the argument that Mike DeWine handled COVID in his state better than almost any other governor. I've always loved Mike DeWine. When he was back in Congress, uh, I think in the 90s he was in Congress. I liked him then. I just thought he was just such a smart, reasonable guy. Like, it would never happen in the modern Republican Party. But could you imagine if Mike DeWine, if the Republicans had nominated him to be president? Now, that's a guy that would probably win the election, again, because of the structural advantages I think Republicans have in this election. Like, he's just a sensible, reasonable guy. Unfortunately, people like him... It's, it's hard to succeed in both parties for people like him. It's particularly hard to succeed in the Republican Party, which is why we need, you know, structural reforms in our elections as well. It's not just about moving past the Trump era, although I think that's part of it. We also need some structural reforms. By the way, I just saw this today. Six states on the ballot this November will have um, inflation will be 2% the next four years, no matter who wins, John says. That's, that's probably true. I mean, you look at the inflation's back down now. Like, I love how we, Trump and everyone, we got a lower inflation. Here's what, inflation's down to 2.5%. Like, the only way to get it, and, and heading down, the only way to get it, like, negative to lower prices is to have a recession. Like, you don't want that. You don't want prices to, to across the economy, decrease. Because that would mean your economy is essentially flat. Like the depression that happened. Prices. Herbert Hoover, by the way, was the last president to oversee a long period of deflation. Do we want to go back to the Herbert Hoover? Of course not. So we're basically no. back there. No, we don't. But what was what was I talking about? I got sidetracked. Oh, um, oh, the structural reforms. Six states yeah. on the ballot will have voter referendums this November to... Um, go with eliminating partisan primaries. That is a huge step. California, we have that. Alaska has that. And what, what that would mean is Republican, Democrat, Independent, you vote in the primary for the same slate of candidates. And then that for, for House, Senate, Governor, State Legislature, and then whoever gets the top two, three, four votes moves on to the November election regardless of party. That takes it out of and makes it more likely that moderate candidates advance to the November election. Because, look, we know most of the people in the House, the vast majority of the 435 members in the House, their biggest threat to re-election is not the general election. It's the primary. On the left and the right, the vast majority of Republicans and Democrats are in districts where they will likely win the general election pretty easily. But they, they are scared to death of a primary challenge. And what does that do? That causes them to move further to the left and further to the right. If you have independent primaries, nonpartisan primaries, it makes it more likely that moderate candidates will be able to advance to the general election. And some of these states will, will institute ranked choice voting as well, which, you know, Charlie, I'm a huge proponent of. Like, there's nothing we can do that I know of that's easy to solve polarization social media algorithms like that stuff is kind of baked in like you're not going to turn off the algorithms that lead us into these media silos that's hard to fix the way we structure elections is the easiest simplest thing we could do to do what you and i talk about make it more likely that the mike dewines of the world have a chance in elections and less likely that say the jim jordans of the world uh, win elections and that would make our democracy so much better. HB Card says, I don't think this race is as close as Eric thinks it is. I'm with you, Charlie. So take that, Eric. And then. Well, look, because... I think he's right. If uh, if you're talking about the popular vote, I actually kind of agree. I think Kamala Harris is, I would put it like 80% plus she's going to win the popular vote. I don't think it's, and it, I don't, I think it might, it's not going to be that close. I think it'll be yeah. three, two, three, four points. But again, do you really like. I'm asking, uh, who was it that said that? Was it John? It was uh, HB Cards. HB Cards. Yeah, I would just want to know, HB, what do you think the odds are that that Harris wins the Electoral College? Because that's what I mean, I, though. Like when yeah, I say that, when I, I, I say who wins like, the election, yeah, you you mean the Electoral College? Like yes. I would, I think she would. Like again, gun to my head, had to make a prediction today. I think Harris will win the Electoral College. 
But I don't think it's 80% like I do with the popular vote. I'd give it like maybe 60-40 Harris wins, which is pretty close to a coin flip. I mean, if I told you there's a 40% chance you're going to die today, would you feel great? You know what I'm saying? But if I told you there was a 1% chance you were going to die today, you'd still be a little nervous, but you'd feel a lot better, right? So a 40% chance of something happening is pretty freaking high. I'm calling it again. I think Harris wins Nevada. I'm going to say North Carolina. And by the way, I'm bringing this back up because John Reibold says inflation will be 2% the next four years, no matter who wins. And here's another thing. AI is going to take probably millions of people's jobs over the next four years. And people are going to blame it on whoever's in pres whoever's in the presidency. Right. Just, you know, so, so right now start blaming either Kamala <laughs> Harris or Donald Trump when AI replaces you know, 10% of our workforce and they're going to blame it on whoever wins the election because that's already happening. Oh, you wanted to, uh, before we get out of here, I know you had mentioned this earlier. You wanted to talk about that Harris interview. She did an interview with a local Philadelphia TV station. And I actually watched, it was a 10 minute interview last week. I think it was her first solo TV interview. Yes. Okay. So let's go quick because I have to go pick up my kids. I will, I will say this. I'll just read this last uh, HB card says, I think she'll overperform or at least get what Biden did in the electoral college. Okay. I kind of, that's, that's where that. I am. I could see that. Here's what I think with Kamala. Kamala is not great at interviews. She needs to do more. Maybe this is why she's not doing more. She was really good in the debate, but like the first question, you know, give me two specific examples. And it's a meme now of, I grew up, I grew up a, a middle-class kid with nice lawns. Right. Like it is hilarious. You know, now it's the thing on Twitter or social media. Whenever somebody asks, you know, my mom told me to uh, mow the lawn. And I said, you know, mom, I grew up a middle class child. Like, <laughs> get to the point. I understand Kamala Harris wants to be a storyteller and create these yeah. narratives and all that. But like, that wasn't good. It wasn't as bad as, as right wing pundits. Oh, it's the worst word salad ever. But like, she needs to get to the point a little more. I think that's fair. Yeah, a couple of points on that. First of all, if you have watched a Donald Trump speech or interview, he says the same things over and yes. over again. They're letting the, you know, they're emptying their insane asylums. I mean, all of it. It, it. So politicians do this. Her opponent certainly doesn't. But I do think it is a fair critique of her. I think what has happened with Harris, A, I think she's a very cautious politician by nature, which has advantages and has disadvantages. And that's one of the disadvantages. But B, I think what happened is because she is not well known, People know who she is, but they don't know her well. I think she felt felt like, and her campaign feels like, they have to, every chance they get, introduce her and provide biography. And I think that made a lot of a sense. That made a lot yeah. of sense in the convention speech. Maybe even in the debate a little bit. But I think it makes less sense now that time has gone by and she's doing these short interviews. So, for instance, when she gets asked that question about the economy, she spent a minute going through this bio, two minutes, Skip all that. Just get right. Because the back half of her answer to that question was fine. It was about some of the policies he wants to implement. It was perfectly normal politician stuff. Just get to that right away. Skip the bio stuff. And just be like, hey, here's what I want to do. But at a certain point, you just kind of have to assume people probably know the bio stuff. And when you only have a 10-minute interview, you just get right into it. But I think you're right. Look, I think she's overly cautious. Again, my sense that i have that harris is a far superior candidate to trump does not mean i think she's a perfect candidate by any means as you know joe biden always used to say don't compare me to the almighty compare me to the other guy and that's the thing with harris right it's she is not barack obama clearly but i think she can be better and the way she can get better in my opinion is a do more interviews but just the bio stuff, let it go i mean if you want to do a quick anecdote here or there fine but make it about policy what would you do? What would Trump do? How is it different? Boom. That should be every answer. Here's what I want to do. Here's what Donald Trump wants to do. Here's why what I want to do is better on any issue, on immigration, on the economy, on health care. That should be how you answer every single question on those topics. If you're Kamala Harris, contrast, because if it's just about a, a referendum on the Biden-Harris administration, that, as I said before, that is advantage Trump. If it's a comparison, here is what I stand for. Here's what he stands for. Here's where our plans are different. I think that's advantage Harris. So you need to turn it back to that comparison and contrast, not 
Oh, I was a middle class girl from California. Yeah, yeah. With a nice lawn. Yeah. And I do think I, I got to go, but it feeds the narrative, which I think is true that they're basically scripting it and they're hiding. You know, even that interview was 10 minutes with a local news guy and her interview yeah. with Dana Bash with Tim Walls. I think all together, it couldn't have been more than about 20, 25 minutes. And look, Trump says crazy things all the time, but he sits down for hour long podcasts with Theo Vaughn and the Nelk boys right. and all in podcasts and everybody. And I wish Harris would do more of that. I don't, I don't know if, if typically she's that cautious, we've seen her laughing and coconut trees. I think people like personality. I don't know. I think she should do more. I look, I think the biggest critique I have of her campaign, I think they've done a lot of things very well uh, considering the expedited time frame. but my biggest criticism remains they have not put her out there enough. And, and I want to be clear when I say this, on friendly media, Trump yes. isn't going on MSNBC. Trump's not going on CNN. He's not going on ABC or NBC or CBS. He's not doing that. He did do the black journalist. That was good. But for the most part, I see Trump on Fox News every other day. Yeah. Different show. He's doing, as you mentioned, these podcasts to cater to audiences that are sympathetic. That's what she should be doing. There are a ton of left-leaning podcast hosts. Go on all of them. Go on MSNBC every third day. You don't have to do, I, as a person who likes that kind of thing, I would like to see her do hostile media. But I'm saying from a strategic standpoint, just get on friendly media and get yourself out there and get comfortable. I think they're making a mistake by not doing more of that. Love it. All right, I got to go. Comment, like, subscribe. Thanks for watching. Thank you, Eric. Everybody settle down. We will see you soon. See you, buddy. End stream.